Brett Okamoto, Islam Makhachev. I want to give you my impressions. I want you to react to um, what I just saw against Moises in uh, uh, this last Saturday night. He reminds me, in his way, of Floyd Mayweather or Kobe Bryant. And what I, the reason I'm saying that is he, ha- he takes the initiative, even though it's wrestling and it doesn't, it's not obvious, like there's no big things happening. He is initiating. The other guy's reacting to him. And for every reaction, he has a counter. You know, if, if, if you try to defend Kobe Bryant, he counter, 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 and he could keep doing it until he got himself a shot. Same thing with Floyd, because they're, they not only have put the time in that they have the, the technique, but they also think faster than the other guy. And watching him work against Moises was like a, it's like watching a Chinese finger trap or something. Like, the, the more you struggle, it's like quicksand, the worse it gets for you. I'm not saying he's the best lightweight in the world right now, but who would be favored to beat him? That's my kind of takeaway from this last Saturday night. Yeah, it was my takeaway too. I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you're trying to steal my tweets or what, Max. But I said the same thing. I asked my following on Twitter, "Who would you favor against this guy?" And it's kind of a weird question because it's not that I think he is the exact same thing as Habib. It's not that I think that uh, you know he's just the second coming of Habib. They're, they're obviously very similar in a lot of things they do. They're also very, very, very different in their own ways. Um, and quite frankly, I do think that there are some other more well-rounded lightweights on the planet. But what you're describing, especially when Islam gets guys to the floor, it's, um, it, it, you know, those other guys that you mentioned in terms of just making things worse when you're trying to guard them, there's also a very, very strong base of fundamentals, right? right. It's, it's like when somebody's just dominating you, um, particularly, I think in, in combat sports, you talk about a Floyd Mayweather. Their, their fundamentals are just so rock That's right. solid, and so what that means is that Islam is 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 beating you in literally every position that 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 you're in. Whether it's as soon as he gets his hands on you, basically, as soon as he makes that initial shot, even if you're able to stay on your feet initially, he's already clasping his hands. He's already get you know throwing your weight off balance. He's already beating you at every little step along the way. And I think that. Um, you know, I, I've heard guys talk about it when they talk about Habib is that you try to solve one problem. And by the time you end up solving that one problem, you've got three more to deal with. And, and, and Islam has that on the floor, which to then circle back to your, your final question of who would be favored against him. I'm not sure anybody would. I'm not sure anybody in this division would be favored against Islam because the one similarity that he does have with Habib is that once he takes you down, you do not get up. So yeah. you basically are asking uh, these other lightweights to stay on their feet for 25 minutes or knock him out before you get taken down. Because by the time you get taken down, the fight is over. You're not going to get back up. And Habib had that quality and so does Islam. Habib had, was more of like an animal to me. He had more raw kind of like um, maybe physical strength or athletic fast twitches or something that was more obviously impressive. But Makhachev is someone who is, for, for me, like, I, look, I thought it was really good when way back when Dana and, and the UFC was like, no, you stand him up again, right? Because people don't want to see just two guys rolling around jockeying for minute kind of advantages in position. Uh, but like, I can geek out on that stuff. And watching him work is really something. You to- you brought up the fundamentals. It starts with the fundamentals. That's right. It's when the guy has the fundamentals down to a muscle memory where where everything is done correctly without thought. And that frees up his thinking because he's able to then process what's happening to him and get to the next thing, get to the next thing, get to the next thing. It felt like another analogy I use is like a chess master where every move that is made against him, he, it's like he's tightening the screws and, the, and, the, and it's just getting worse for you or a go master, right? Something like that. Let's talk about, and by the way, Twitter challenge, 1240 a.m., not saying he's the best lightweight in the world, but would Makachev be the underdog against under 155 pounder? What time was your tweet? What time was your tweet? You got to beat 12:40 a.m. Yeah. Uh, I mean, whenever the main event up. ended, it would have been like three three minutes after it. Mm. So uh, get just get, your, get the fact checkers on it. But uh, I, I, I'd wager money know. that mine was before yours, Max. I don't know. You're I don't getting, know. I, I throw down the <laughs> challenge. 12:40 a.m. Brett, there it is. I'm throwing <laughs> down the challenge. <laughs> Uh, not listen. Not that either statement. Not that that statement is the most original in the world. I think a lot of people are thinking the same thing. But let's talk about the top lightweights. If, like, and, and how does Makhachev now move into that picture? Right. If you are a, a ranked lightweight, ranked in the top five, do you fight him? 
I, I think we're to that point now where they don't have a choice. I, I think they're going to not have a choice. Previously, you can get away from it. You know, you can. Uh, the best thing you can do is just ignore the guy. I mean, the second that you respond to him, then you're drawn in. You know, and, and then there's there's a story to be to, to be talked about. I mean, if I was a top five lightweight, I just wouldn't be even talking about the guy. Um, and, and not that. You know, none of these guys, we, we bring this up all the time, and you I'm sure you know this, Max. I'm sure it's something that you probably said, you know, covering the boxing world and on the mixed martial arts world as well, is that none of these guys are really scared of one another. It's sure, just Islam is not a guy you want to fight. You don't want to fight him, man. I mean, it's just like the style that he has, the grueling nature of the camp and the preparations that you have to have to, to face the guy. Um, you know, you said something that, that kind of uh, was interesting to me is that, uh, you know, you can, you can geek out about guys on the floor. I think the reason that the casual MMA fan can geek out about someone like a Khabib or someone even like an Islam to a lesser extent is because they recognize dominance when they see it. You know, they, right. for the most part, they don't want to see wrestling in the octagon. I think that hardcore fans, they like to see it. They appreciate it. But by and large, you know, your basketball, baseball, football guys who are just tuning into a fight, they don't want to see wrestling. But with Habib, they understood that, like, no one can stop this. And, and, and we as human beings like to see, you know, somebody get so good at something that literally that other people can't stop it, even though they know it's coming. And I think Habib had that clearly. And so does Islam when he gets it to the floor. So I do think that that'll be an attraction of Islam is that he is just so dominant on the floor that typically we would say it's a boring fight style, but it will appeal to some people. I think the relationship obviously to Habib helps tremendously. You asked how he gets a fight against these top five guys. Habib is going to help him, man. Habib understands. Habib is out there doing interviews and he's talking about Islam. He's in the corner of Islam. That's going to happen. And quite frankly, it's just, it's reached the point where these guys are not going to be able to avoid him because of his relationship to Islam. Now he's coming off of a main event. He's got an eight fight win streak. I believe his next fight will probably be in Rafael dos Anjos. Frankly, I think a fight against Tony Ferguson would be fantastic. I think it would be great matchmaking by the UFC. Mm. I do think Tony Ferguson, after what we've seen, he's been, he's been losing to grapplers. He'd That's be at right. a heavy disadvantage to that. But, you know, Tony, that, that could be a, a, a high-risk but high-reward situation for Tony Ferguson, quite frankly. If he was able to go out and beat Islam, then he shoots right back up into the title contention. So I actually think that would be the perfect fight. Bad styles matchup for Tony. Likely. Good styles matchup for Makachev, I think. I want to get to something. This is how this is how much we geek out on this stuff. That the first thing I want to talk to you about, Brett, is is the fight that just occurred and you know, a grappler who's not super well known yet to casual fans, but and I and I didn't talk about Conor McGregor. And um but but we have to talk about Conor McGregor before we get out of here. Connor, yeah, we have to. We got to do it. It's in it's in everyone's contract who talks about uh, sports of any kind. If you talk about the UFC, we're obligated, everybody. But Connor talked about a stress fracture heading into the fight. Mm -hmm. Ask Dana, ask the doctor, you know, stress fracture. Um, I'll tell you why. Some people are like, oh, sour grapes. There's always an excuse when you lose. I'll tell you why that strike, it lands on me a little bit different, this one. Because the bone of his leg snapped. You know, like his bone broke. It's not, and there was no mm -hmm. obvious moment watching the fight where you go, there, it happened there. He checked him right there, and that's when it happened. He kicked him right there. I'll bet you it happened right. I didn't see it. Maybe it's possible there was a moment where it happened, but I didn't see it where it was, where it was uh, blatant. And therefore, since a guy's bone snapped in a way where, like, I don't know, how did that happen? Then it's, it's, it's uh, credible to me if he says, actually, my leg was weak heading into the fight. Um, now, He's been more gracious in defeat and shown more humility in the past, but of course he could afford to at that point. There have been enough losses now where he's a little bit cornered. He needs to have an excuse, but Brett, that's a pretty good excuse to me if his foot snapped and he said, I had a stress fracture there. Your thoughts? I agree with you. It's a good excuse. And I agree with you that, and hey, he's got photo evidence of it. I don't know if you've seen it, but he's posted some photos on social media of him, you know, um, with a boot on and with uh, his icing his shin. And you don't you don't do those types of things for, you know, preordained um, excuses that you want to make after the fight. I do believe that he was dealing with some things with that left leg. M my question is, look, if, if you have stress fractures, it's kind of a difficult injury to deal with as, as far as especially when, you know, you're a mixed martial artist and it's like all these fights are it's not like you're fighting every week. You only get paid when you fight. So uh, what 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 risk are you willing to take? How are you going to address the, the, the stress fracture? If he was dealing with stress fractures, that's just a tough thing to kind of know what to do with. But why was he throwing so many kicks? And I have seen a lot of people mention this and it, it's the easy thing to kind of bring up. But I think it is the correct thing if he was dealing with that. You know, those types of kicks that he was throwing, Max, he wasn't really setting them up. He was just winging them 
a hundred percent. It's not like he wanted to kind of get Dustin to think about the kick and just like kind of mask that injury. And then, then he could land something with the left hand. He was trying to, to hurt Dustin with those kicks. And if you are aware that this was an, uh, an issue going into the fight, why are you just going out there blazing hundred mile per hour naked kick attempts? I, it just doesn't seem like a well thought out strategy to me. Well, and my, then that baked well, itself I mean, into the, the rest of Connor's problems is that like, is his preparation what it needs to be to beat these guys? Well, no. I mean, he. I think you made a great point in the wrap-up stuff when we were talking uh, Sports Center. I don't even remember what hit we were doing, but you were talking about it's not simply like, hey, Connor, you need to care more and try harder. It's that in his absence from top-flight competition, his rivals, his peers in his age group continued to improve and round out their game. He didn't. But something that Dominic Cruz brought up before the fight, I think, explains the kicking, which is... Connor used to fight at kickboxers dis distance, right? He would get under people's skin leading up to the fight. They would want to kill him, right? And then the 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 fight starts and he's he's baiting them again, right? Fighting off the back yep. foot at kickboxers distance. They overextend, he jumps in, catches them with a counter left hand. He could have power and speed, and then he, you know, they they'd be stunned, hammer fist fight over. So I think he was conscious about doing that against a fellow southpaw because he started fighting, as Dominic Cruz pointed out, at boxer's distance. And against a southpaw who's going to start to give you those leg kicks, that basically that's how he lost the second fight, Connor. So he wanted to use those kicks to keep at a distance, really as kind of like offense being the best defense against those leg kicks. But what all Wasn't that there tells less me— he could throw though max like if he if he really wanted to get dustin to think about kicks and he wanted to draw him into the scenario where now dustin is coming to him and he can use his counter boxing which he really sure. hasn't used as effectively i mean that's how he knocked out jose aldo right look back right. on that fight but if he wanted to get dustin thinking about kicks why is he does he have to throw them with the with with the uh the, the ill intent that he did especially if he was that concerned about the legs going in I, that that's the one that's those are the two things that just i can't agreed. i can't get them to line up in my mind uh, agreed and and the fact is and and you know he was losing the fight, and he was losing it badly, you know, before the leg snapped. As I, I said after the fight, it's a, in a sense, it's a, you know, pun intended, it's a lucky break because it is a plausible excuse, right? He did have a stress fracture, apparently. It, you know, it was the leg that snapped, and so that explains how the fight ended, and it allows him to skirt the point that he was getting beaten up before then. But, Brett, if he can't, keep him at a boxer's distance because of the leg kicks. If he can't keep him at a kickboxer's distance because his leg is compromised and, it, and, you know, he says, oh, I have a titanium rod in there now. It's going to be better than ever. Okay, we'll see going forward. And he can't win the fight on the ground. How does he win? And, and you know, Poirier may or may not be the best lightweight in the world. Probably a top three lightweight. Time was Connor mm -hmm. was the best guy in arguably two divisions. Is he a top five guy in any division now? Is he top ten? I mean, you had people the night of the fight saying he's done, right? And um, I don't know if I would just say Connor's done, but it's not looking great for him right now, right? It's not adding up. And even if you consider that he was injured going into the fight, even if you believe him, okay, fine, you were injured going into the fight, but uh, you've now lost twice to the same guy. You know, like we were talking earlier, I think you and I just off camera about like, hey, it's okay to lose in mixed martial arts, but I don't think it's necessarily okay to lose to the same guy. Because then once that happens, then, then it's just hard to tell anybody that you're the best lightweight in the world because you lost to one of them definitively twice. And now you've got a situation where he's going to be rehabbing for a while. You're not going to see him again for a year. I mean, inactivity has been a problem already. We, we, what we're describing here is an inactivity problem. And so now he's going to be gone for another year. I think even the most stalwart Connor fans will say that this is, this is very, very dangerous. I, I I said that if this guy goes out and he puts on social media, Max, and he's putting out stuff about the rehab and he's saying he's kicking again and he's saying he's a new man, let's say he even changes camp. So let's say he brings in, you know, some, some UFC lightweights or some UFC featherweights and he's taking photo ops and he's showing that he's taking, that things are changing. I mean, it doesn't even almost matter what changes, just that there have been drastic changes. I think people will buy in. I think ESPN will buy in. The casual sports fan will buy in and say, I want to see this guy fight Dustin Poirier when he's at 100%. I think that's all on the table for him. But his ability to win that fight, I mean, you got to show it to me at this point. And wow. I think I was talking to a guy who sets the odds. And they say that Dustin Poirier would be a 3-1 to one favorite now against I, Conor McGregor. I think that's generous to Conor. I think three to one is generous. And I have a suggestion. If Connor really wants to get back to the top, enjoy. He's, he's still athletic. He can punch. He can box. He's still confident. He can be confident. I believe he can regain that. When he was a featherweight, he was a big guy. 
Like, you know, and what happens as fighters get older, it's not just that they put on that natural mass as you get older. They sometimes start to lack the discipline to continue to make the weight. They don't want to torture themselves the same way. And they give up a size advantage that was once really useful to them. It, it, to me, if Connor really wanted to get to the top, get down to the featherweight division. I don't see him beating the top lightweights, but, and I don't see him ever beating the top lightweights. But time will tell. Brett Okamoto, appreciate you jumping on with me, brother. Oh, I appreciate it, dude. Yeah, it was a good time. Let's do it again. Talk soon. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.